All right, so last time we talked about classes. There's the link to the recorded lecture. <clears throat> you have this classes assignment to do. And uh, so at this point, there's um, we're like, no new material is needed. It's just review. So I'm just going to take your suggestions what to do here. You know, what do you need to, uh, to do? Number one on classes. It's a rectangle class, right? Let's take a look at this. Provide an implementation of a rectangle class. I'm just going to copy that. The class should be usable in the following program. Include this program in your submitted work. The rectangle class definition and main function should be in a single file named ex1.cpp. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at that. So it's a rectangle class. And uh, you know, we're going to put something in here. These are the member variables. And we'll need a constructor. And the constructor will take arguments. And then we'll have some functions, whatever they are. <coughs> so we have the class, class name here. Member variables should have at least one. Well, I mean, you could have zero. It's all right. But it wouldn't, the class wouldn't store any state then instances of the class wouldn't represent any kind of state that would change. You have to have at least one member variable. If instances of the class contain some kind of state which will which can be modified by calling functions. <clears throat> there is a default constructor that gets created for classes if you don't define your own. If you define any constructor, then the default constructor is not generated. And the class name we use here. That, that's actually sufficient. This will generate a default constructor. It has no data in it. The compiler will accept that. Oh, and this is inside beanjar.h. What I want to do is put that in main. We'll put everything in one file. <coughs> so here's the main. It's the rectangle. This is the UML diagram. It's not always needed, but we'll do it this time. And we're going to create an instance of a rectangle. So we're just calling the default constructor here, that <coughs> no also called the no argument constructor. Let's just see if uh, this works. Looks all right. So the problem gives us some test code. Let's take a look at the test code. The test code doesn't not include a call to the no argument constructor. We'll take that out. 
So the first thing we do in line 33 is to create a rectangle with width of 3 and height of 4. Called foo. And then we'll create another rectangle called bar, but this is actually a square because it has a width and height of 5. And then <coughs> we print the area of rectangle foo is, and then we call the area function of the rectangle class on the foo object to get the area, which is just the width times the, times the height. So we need to define a constructor that takes two arguments. And we'll need to define an area method that takes no arguments and returns a number, a double. So maybe in the, in the problem statement, I should have done something like this, just to show that it's, um, those should be floating point numbers. Because, you know, area calculations don't make much sense unless you have, uh, well, actually, you know, two integer values you can get. Uh, you can also have area. So actually, this is not, you can, you can work with integers. It's still OK. But I'll use double here. <clears throat> so the constructor rectangle takes a width and a height and let's just initialize our member variable width and height whoops let's just initialize that those member variables width and height to to the uh, parameters coming in in the constructor. We need to declare these. Well, the editor is really friendly today. It's just showing me the words I need. <coughs> so do you see how that works? We're using an initialization list here. So the constructor should run. Or this width right there is the width that's being passed into the constructor. This width here is the member variable width. If this is confusing for you, you can do this. Is that easier to look at? Yeah, it is for you now, but <coughs> later you'll you'll probably like it the other way. You can do it like that. And we need an area function. Area returns a double. It'll be const. It should be const because Calling the area function does not modify the state of the rectangle that it's called on. <coughs> you just return the width times the height. There it is. So we're creating two instances of the rectangle class. One is called foo, <coughs> the other is called bar. The class is like a pattern. It's like the cookie cutter. And the instances or the objects created out of the class, those are the cookies that are stamped out of the cookie cutter. I heard that analogy so, so many years ago, it just stuck with me. I didn't invent that. Um, so 
Any questions? Yeah. Um, lens 27 and 22. Yeah, that's because we have braces here. So the compiler knows that's the end of a definition of something. If you put it there, it's OK. But uh, it's not, it's almost never used. Just uh, not necessary. These are functions. To another way to make this, you know, rather than showing them in a single line, you can spread these out like that, see? Or you can take this <coughs> function out of the class and define it out here. To define a function outside the class, we need to precede the function name with the class name separated with colons. Now the now we have two implementations. This compiler, the compiler will complain. It'll say something like. Redundant, redundant definitions or something like that. Redefinition, there it is. Redefinition of um, the area function. So we only want one definition of the function. We can have multiple declarations. That's a declaration. Here we're declaring the existence of the function, what it, what it returns, what it takes as arguments, and that it's a const. That's part of the declaration. But it doesn't provide the code needed to specify its behavior when it's invoked. <coughs> that is done down here. This is the function definition. We call this a definition. Up here, we call this a declaration. And we can do the same thing for the constructor. to keep the pattern the same. We'll do it like that. Once again, we're going to get redefinition. Redefinition error. Well, not quite. Oh, I get a different error. See, I didn't, this, we took the constructor out of the class, but we need to, um, We need to tell the compiler that this function that we're defining, this constructor function, is a member of the rectangle class. Forgot that. Now we get the redefinition error. Uh, we don't, actually. We get something else. Oh, we got the wrong name there. I will get a redefinition error in a second. All right, let's take a look at that. Redefinition, finally. Uh, we got it to fail the way we want it to fail. So this, this is the this here is the definition part. We just put a semicolon there instead. We just state the existence of this function, give its form, what it looks like on the outside. But we don't provide the details on how it executes when it's invoked. Understanding is that the um okay, so the, the numbers they go up the enter fraction one to the other. The and it goes back and then when it says double area, then it goes back down to the double area and then it goes is that is that right? So uh can you go ahead ask me that one more time? Like okay, so the well, just line numbers if you can. Okay, so when you run the program, it goes to main function 18, 19, and then it goes back up to... Um, wait, wait, wait. When you run the main function, so you're saying execution yeah. enters here, right? Yeah, so it goes there. Then it, goes, then it does this. So this is a function. This is a function invocation. Line 44 is a functioning invocation. Which function runs here? And it, and it goes back up to 27. 
no, 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 no. It doesn't jump up to 27 and jump down to 35. That's not how to think about it. Okay. This, this code here is not, uh, you can't just read it like that. <clears throat> this, this thing, this thing, all of this stuff kind of disappears. It's just used to generate the, the uh, machine instructions and uh, initialize, the, and, and initialize the memory to a starting state. This, uh, this, is, this line 44 calls the constructor function, right? And over here, this is where we declare the constructor. It's like, uh, it's like you're going to a, um, like a convention or a dinner party or something, right? And everybody has names on the tables that you're sitting at, okay? And your name is on a table, right? <coughs> but you're standing over here. You're not near the table, okay? And if someone wants to shake your hand, they're not going to go up to the declaration of you. They're not going to shake the hand of the label on the table. They're going to go to you, right? right? So that's the difference here. This is just like the label on the table, line 27. It just declares the presence or existence of the function. But the actual function is defined down here. So maybe a better mental model, and this is just a model, and it's not exactly how things work, because it's just a way to think about it, is that um, execution jumps to line 38. You can think of it like that. Okay? <laughs> and it does not jump to line 27. But it's not a bad idea. I mean, actually, what we need to do is form these mental models that we use to reason about the code and what's going to happen when we compile and hit run, right? And these mental models, just as I described my suggested mental model, it's not really what's happening. Because there is no line 38. When, when the, the compiler reads this stuff and generates a bunch of numbers, those numbers are fed into the CPU, you know, and executed one after another, unless there's a jump statement, you know, and then, then there's a non-sequential loading of an instruction out of the sequence. So what's happening on the hardware level doesn't really resemble your mental model that you're using to build the program. So over time, you know, you need to make adjustments to this mental model and, um, and work with it like that. That's why, of course, it's beneficial to learn something like computer <coughs> organization when you study. We have a course, number 310. It's called computer organization. It really means computer architecture. It's how the computer is physically, you know, not the case or the disk drive, the CPU part in the RAM. How the how the function how the hardware actually runs. So you study that. Now you're not normally most programmers. There's some some people working in the industry are are dealing with hardware. They're designing hardware, building it, so on. But most, uh, most people in the industry are just using the hardware at a level higher than the hardware. But it, it benefits you to look at how the hardware runs and to look at the interface between hardware and software. Because then you can make adjustments to these crude and simplified mental models that you've been learning to use and developing to solve these programming problems. So it just it fills out that missing underlying layer of knowledge. So it's a, it is a progression from you know not knowing nothing to knowing more and more. And I, even me, you know, it, you know, my age and, and background, I'm I'm still adjusting my concepts all the time. I always make an adjustment. It's it's a very malleable thing you know, how we understand uh, what we're doing here. So I would say getting back to your you know, that's a long-winded sort of response to your question. I would say it's, it's better to think about, if you want to think in terms of jumping somewhere, when you're line to 44, you're going to jump to line 38. And then line 39 runs. And, and you look at, what is it, 939, it, it, it does two things. So you can stage it out like that. The first thing, it multiplies width times height. And it gets a result, see? Now, that's the first step. Then the second step is it returns it. You know, think of it like that. It throws it back. 
and then so that this this thing oh, sorry, oh I made a big mistake I'm sorry line 44 goes to line 35 so excuse me about that yeah sorry about that line 30 it's line 46 that calls this foo dot area that goes to line 38 okay but this uh, line 44 which is the constructor will um, cause a jump to line 35 in this crude sort of model that we have. Because this is the thing, that the, when you see the braces here, you know that this is an implementation of a function. And you don't see anything in this function. That's because we did the job using the initialization list here. Now, let me do this. Let's, let's, uh, let's change this. And this is the alternative form. So that's another way to define the constructor. We don't need to use an initialization list. We can, <coughs> we can uh, show those assignment operations in the body of the constructor function itself. And I want to say that there is a difference between the two, that this I believe, once again, I'm, this is my mental model that I've refined, but I have not actually looked at a C++ compiler inside to see what it does. Okay, so I don't know. And, um, but I think what it does here is it, it creates, it allocates a memory. Maybe it's equivalent, actually. It could be equivalent. It allocates memory to store a rectangle instance. So it needs memory to store the eight bytes to store the width. It needs eight bytes to store the height. And then it needs a, some pointer in there called a pointer to the V table. And I think that that's done here. It's been a while since I looked at this. So I think it needs another eight bytes in there on a, on a 32 bit <coughs> machine. Sorry, on a 64 bit machine. It's going to need another eight bytes. And uh, so the total size of this rectangle instance will be uh, 24 bytes. Let's see if that's correct. I think it's eight bytes for the width, eight bytes for the height, and another eight bytes for some pointer that's used. I'm just going to guess at that. Now let's take a look at that. Oh, you know what? Foo. Yeah, I think that's right. This will work. No, it's only two. It's only eight, two, eight bytes. It's only 16 bytes. I'm wrong. So my mental model is wrong. So 16 bytes, that's the size of foo. It's uh, 8 bytes for width, 8 bytes for height. So look, we're creating two of these. So that's, um, you know, that's a 32 bytes now we're taking up in RAM. Yeah. So um, I've been previously been wondering why we Um, yeah, the functions, a function, you can have a function in private as well. So you can have, um, you know, let's create a function called widen. And uh, this is the sort of multiplier. And uh, we can call widen. And widen is going to uh, widen the thing. So we're going to do uh, width. Oh, what did I do? 
width equals width uh, times the multiplier. So, but widen is written in the private section. It just <coughs> means outside code can't call widen. So, you know, inside code can call it. I can, in area, I can call widen. All right, so each time we call it, we're going to widen it by, um, you know, 10%. It widens it by 10% right there. Now, this won't compile because we're modifying the state of the object, so we'd have to take off const here. I mean, it's silly. You wouldn't want to, you know, have an area function widen the rectangle every time you call the area function. So it doesn't make sense. But just to talk about the issues, if you have a private member function, that means only other functions in the class can call it. Nobody else, main can't call widen. The main is not a function inside the class. But area, area is a function inside the class. So area can call widen. The private just means who can touch me. You know, is it if it's if I'm private, it's just the other member functions. If it's public, it's all code in the in the program. Does that answer your question? I mean, I think so. But hold on, one more yet. So is it possible to have nothing in private and everything? In yeah, private? absolutely. Yeah, this is not not required at all. This this is perfectly valid right here. It's perfectly valid. Everything's public. Sure. Okay. Um, now, what happens if we took this out? Who knows? <laughs> There's a default. We we'll call it like a. Let's call this visibility. Who can see these things, right? If the default is private, so everything becomes private. So that no, nothing can call into it. It's a useless class. You know, main cannot call the constructor, so it cannot create any instances of the class. It has no, this class has no use. It cannot be used. How about if we did this? This is, this is the same thing except that everything is now public by default. So struct and a class are pretty much identical except for this one aspect, that when you declare a data type as a struct, the, the default visibility is uh, public. And for class, it's private. Now, in the C, this word struct comes from the C language. It represents something that wasn't quite a class, but it was resembled what we now use as classes. It's this thing called a struct. So it's a part of the earlier version of this language called a C language. That's where it came from. But the struct of the C language has been changed to, to be the same as a class with default uh, public visibility. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. Like, what other questions are there? What, what doubt and lack of understanding do you have here? You know, it has to do with forming a mental model. Once you're happy with your model and say, well, I can do this work now. Okay, I can take a lunch break. I'm hungry. And that's it, you know? So you go as far as you need to go. And, uh, and then you carry on, right? And then the next day, you're going to say, well, i got to learn a little more here. I'm going to refine my, my, my model. And uh, or so I'll just do something else. So it is a, it's a process of um, you know, incremental sort of conquering of the subject matter and, and the attainment of uh, mastery, actually. Right? So you're going to, as, as, you would, as you improve, learn more and refine your concept of what what's going on then um, you can get stuff done right by the time you graduate hopefully you're you've got some mastery of this programming skill and 
you can get a job based on that. And then you have to do, you have to build stuff, like going to build a house. Like, you know, I know how to put up walls. I know how to, you know, insert plumbing and do the wiring. You know, I know that stuff. So, you know, by the time you graduate, you want to know that the skills, the programming skills. It's like building something. Or maintaining. Sometimes, a lot of times you get code that's already existing and you need to maintain it or modify it, add functionality to it. Fix bugs. Okay. Anything else? Is there double colon? Huh? Is there double colon, like on line 40? Line the double colon in line where? 40 or 45. There, yeah. This double colon here, this is just uh, to separate this name here. This is the class name. It's a label for this. This this is the function name here, rectangle. And we put this, this prefix in front of it to tell the compiler that that rectangle function is in the rectangle class. Oh, widen. Oh, I messed that up. Look at that. Look at that. We forgot to do that for widen. See, I didn't, I didn't, <coughs> I didn't compile. So that would have been a problem. So here we're saying the widened function is in the rectangle class. Because we're outside of this, this block here, this declaration block. So anything that's inside this block is in the rectangle class. See, so we, we declared class rectangle here. We open the, the brace. And then all this stuff in there is it's implied that that's all, all belongs to, they're all members of the rectangle class. So we do. We don't need to. We don't need to do uh, you know rectangle widen in here. They're already in that declaration block. The compiler knows that widen is a member function of the rectangle class. But out here, we're in the wild. See, it's like Maine. Maine is out here in the wild. It's you know Maine is not in the rectangle class. Right, that's, that's not right. Maine is just a standalone function. It has global scope. It doesn't belong to anything. you wanted to access a function that's inside main, but or access it outside of main, would you do the same thing? Like would you yeah, 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 yeah. Main? Now to get, remember, execution starts in main, so you can't get anywhere unless you go through main. So you got to start in main. Let's say I have another function. We'll call it, uh, we'll call it func. And, um, you know, func, and we'll pass to func, we'll pass a, um, we'll pass a rectangle object. Call it, uh, you know, rect. And, uh, and then here we'll print, uh, you know, rect dot uh, area. All right, so now main will call that function. We create a rectangle called foo, three by four. And then we'll, uh, we'll call this function and pass to it foo. See? So you, execution always starts in main, so if you want any other function to run, you got to call into it. So here, we create a rectangle object, and then we pass it into foo. Now foo gets the rectangle object here as an argument, and it ca simply calls the area method so to print out the area. Let's take a look at that. So the area, 3 by 4, that's 12, right? So then we're increasing it by 10% because we call it widen. So it should end up being, uh, what, 13.2. That's the area because we're doing that silly thing of widening. There it is, 13.2. Yeah, but this this uh, kind of silly. You know, why would you call white in that area function? Don't, you don't want to do that. Convert that back to const the way it ought to be. Now, if we want to call widen, we should do something you know a little little better. So we'll do this. We'll we'll create the foo, and then we're going to widen it. We'll widen it by, uh, you know, by two. 
we're going to double the size. So she got, what's uh, nine times, uh, no, it's line width, so it's uh, six times four, right? So she should just double it, right? So it should be 24. <laughs> So we'll call, we'll print the area, we'll widen, and then we'll print the area again. But something got wrong. Uh, it's private. Oh, widen is private. Look at that. Widen is private. So, see, main can't call widen. It only functions inside of the rectangle class can call widen because widen is private. Well, we got to fix that. If that's how we really want our code to run, then we got to take this out of here. I want to tell you that it's common. It's common that um, that functions are private. It's just it's a common situation. There are cases when you want private functions. Because you, maybe your, your member functions, your public functions, maybe they're getting so complicated that you need to pull out some, maybe, you're, maybe in your public functions, you're performing some calculation across many public functions. Maybe in one function you're going to widen, you need widen. In another public function you need widen. A third public function you need widen. But the outside code is never going to use widen. So that's an internal sort of um, concern. So you, rather than copying the widening code across all your public functions, your public functions are now calling the private widen function. And so we, we, we reorganize. We take out the, this duplicate code that's been copied across many different public functions, and we're moving it into a private function that we can then call from all the public functions. That's a common uh, technique. So there, there's kind of a rule there when you're coding. There's a rule that you don't want to duplicate code. If you have two different functions and you have the same block of code doing the same thing for two different functions, that's called code duplication. So you take that common block of code out, you define, you stick it in a function, and then you simply call that function. So now you've reduced the code duplication in your in the program. I, I don't want to illustrate that. It's take too long to illustrate that. But just to let you know that this is the kind of thing that's called, it's, it goes under the term refactoring. So reorganizing your code to remove code duplication, to make the code more readable, to give it better structure, make it more organized. Train, even though your code is running correctly, you're going to keep working on it because you want to make it more readable. That's called refactoring. You know, it's a very important uh, activity when you're um, developing software. Is there anything else? Um, can you give me a search answer? Yeah, 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 because we're going to need to get ready for the final, right? So let's do. Uh, let's go back to searching. Which one you want to look at? Uh, let's do the binary search. This this one here. Yeah. Okay, this is the binary search. You want me to use vectors or do you want me to use arrays? Uh, arrays. Arrays. Okay. <laughs> Does it become easier to do vectors? No, no, no. It's the same thing. Just whatever you need to, uh, whatever you want to, to see. Because I, I might ask the problem in terms of vectors on the, on the, on the exam. <coughs> okay, so. Vectors? Yeah. Okay. So, in vectors, a vector contains its own size information. So we don't need this argument. That's one difference. All right. And then I'm going to call this a vector, a vector of int. I'm going to use v, it's just easier. Right? And by the way, we don't, we don't need to make a copy 
of the data coming in. So we just need a reference. And we're not going to modify the elements in V, so we can declare that as const. There's the vector version of that function. And then we have main. So let's create a vector here, vector of int. And I'll call this the test vector. I could call it V, just, but I'm going to give it a different name. And what did we do? We did something like this, right? So binary search requires that the data be in the either ascending or descending order. In other words, you can't do binary search if the, if the values are out of order. So let's, um, let's find, well, you want to do the one that returns bool, right, as opposed to int? Yeah. Okay. So this is, tell me if k is in v or not. The other formulation of this problem is, if you, find, if you don't find k, return minus 1. Otherwise, return the position of k in v. That's where you would, that's when you return an int. But we're not going to do that one. We're going to do uh, this one. Tell me if k is in v or not. If it's in v, return true. So if we call this thing and say, you know, 12. 12 is in there. So that should return a true. But uh, 13 is not there, so that should return a false. These are not enough. <coughs> These are not enough uh, test cases. So we'd want to add more, but I'm not going to do that. Normally, you'd want to add more test cases. <coughs> Let's look at binary search. So in binary search, we have to, we have to cut. We, we establish a range of values that we're concerned with. And we're going to cut the range in half and look at the middle. Look at the cut point. So is the value less than that or greater than that? If it's less than that, we go into the first half. If it's greater than that, we'll look in the second half. So we're going to have a loop. So we have some loop here. going to repeat over and over again. So we're going to get this midpoint here. So M, I use M for middle, the midpoint. And we'll have a start and an end. So we have a, we have a start and an end index. And we, we take their average that gives us the midpoint. The midpoint between two values is simply the average of those two values. Once we have the midpoint, we can then check, you know, if is the value we're looking for less than the value at the midpoint? If it is, that means everything that's from the midpoint greater cannot have k. So we're going to take end and set it to the midpoint minus 1. We're going to bring the end down. The end index. Now let's look at the other direction. Well, let's suppose that k turned out to be bigger than the value at m. That means k is in the, the right-hand range, so the right side of the midpoint. So we're going to slide up the start index. We don't set S to M because we looked at M. We know that M, that K is not at M because K is greater than V of M. So K is not at M. It must, the, 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 uh, the best we could do is it would be at M plus 1. I don't know if the best we could do is. Say it again. Yeah, like, 
this here here let's look at this code right here here s is at zero see? and e is at 56 this is the beginning of the of the algorithm and the midpoint is right there now if so the value at m is 12 right now if k is less than 12 i'm talking to talk about line 11 now okay line 11 No, oh, no, I'm sorry. I said k less than 12, right? I'm talking about line 10. Let's suppose that k is less than 12. If k is less than 12, then it's one of those three numbers. We're comparing k to v of m. We're not comparing k to 12. I'm sorry, we're not comparing k to m. m is the, the index. So the hard thing about working with vectors is to distinguish between the index and the value at the index. That's the key. You got to practice that distinction. So if k is less than v of m, less than 12, that means we're going to the, the 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 we might as well set e to there because we don't, you know, there's no reason to set it anywhere higher than that because we know it's got to be in that range. That's why we get the minus one part. We don't want to set e to this because we already know k is not equal to 12. We need it's less than 12. So we're not going to set e to m. We're going to set e to m minus one. I mean, we could be sloppy about it and set it to e m. All right, that, that works too. But it complicates the, the condition. This is a simple condition that works well with the way we have it written. So when s is less than or equal to e, we're going to keep going through this algorithm. By the way, let's, let's finish this. You know, else uh, k is v of m. So if k is neither less than v of m nor greater than v of m, it must be the case that k equals v of m. In that case, we, we, found it. we found it. We got it. So we're going to return true right there. Exit the while loop. Return from the function. We found it. If we didn't find it, we continue this. We're going to calculate m. M is going to be here. All right, we're going to keep going. Let's suppose we're looking for four. Okay, if we're looking for four, we're going to compare. Let's k is four. We're going to compare compare four. K k is four. We're going to compare four to v of m, which is five. Four is less than v of m. So that means we're going to set e to m minus 1. Oh, then e gets right on top of this s. They're the same number now. They're the same index. So the next iteration through the loop, m is going to be the average of e and s. Well, that's just the same number, right? That's the average of two things that are equal. So now we're going to compare k. Is k less than 4? No, because we're, we're pretending that k is 4, right? I'm sorry, is k less than v of m? Is, is 4 less than 3? No. Once again, we're using k equal 4. So k is, k is 4. It's not less than 3. It's not less than v of m. So you go to the next one. Is k bigger than v of m? Is 4 bigger than 3? Yes, it is. It is. It is. So we're going to set s to m plus 1. So s is going to get moved to there. 
So the start index is now bigger than the end index. And we looked at everything. We, we narrowed it down to a single element here, see? And then we ended up comparing to that element. And, you know, if, we, if it wasn't less than V of M and it wasn't greater than V of M, then it would equal V of M, or we would turn true right there. But it's not. We got that K was greater than V of M, so S got moved up to M plus 1. See, S gets set to M plus 1 here. So it went past the endpoint. And that now the loop condition fails. S is no longer less than or equal to E. So we're done. So, of course, we're going to exit the loop. We better turn false at that point. After exiting the loop, we didn't find it. We didn't return true in line 12. We never hit line, line 12. The condition was never true. We never found an M such that k equal to v of m, return false. Does that help a little bit? Maybe. Anything else? Yeah. When is our final? Huh? When is our final? Yeah, when is the final? Does anyone know the final exam? It's Thursday, isn't it? I think it's Thursday. <coughs> yeah, it's Thursday, 10 to 12. Thursday, 10 to 12. Thank you. I'm always afraid. I don't, I don't mind doing this because I'm always afraid I'm going to get this time wrong. I've never you know, gotten the wrong day for the finals, so thank God. But we're here, right? This is how you read this. We meet, we're, we're, we're a Tuesday, Thursday, 10 o'clock class. So the final is going to be on Thursday. All right. Anything else? You know, one of the things I'm doing in my other class, we, we lost some time, so I didn't uh, get into that. How many more meetings do we have? Two? That's a lot, actually. We have a lot. There's like no, no questions. We have two more meetings. So I actually could have included that other material, but it's too late. You know, I won't do that. I won't do that. But um, it was on application development. And if you're interested, if you you know really want to get into this, you might want to check out my lectures on that. So down here, this is where I started the application development uh, presentation, and uh, I talk about this this code on uh, GitHub that I posted. inside experiments, and there's a grid here. So in here, there's uh, just the beginning of a, like a, some kind of a game. So I have this grid, and I'm pressing A, W, S, and D to move around this player character. I hit escape to get out of there. How do you do that? This is not a console program, you see? This thing runs in its own window, and I can draw lines on it. I'm not like printing characters, right? This is a graphics window. And, uh, and I can close it. See, when I click this X here, that's, a, that's an event that I have to handle. You look inside main here. <coughs> Under process event. This is, a, this is where I catch, that's the condition to catch that event where the user clicks the X in the window to close it. So I'm starting to go into more advanced stuff in my other class. And we, I could have done it in this class, but, uh, but uh, we, we decided not to do that because we lost some days in the beginning. All right, I need you to um, 